Next, I'd like to welcome another friend, um, public servant who is no stranger to natural resources. The current um, and friend of the natural gas industry, um, Cabinet Secretary of the Department of Environmental Protection, Austin Caperton. Well, thank you for having me, Ben and Charlie and uh, well, I guess interested parties. Um, I, it's kind of interesting. I, I tell people this and they laugh at me. I have the easiest job I've ever had in my life. As a matter of fact, um, many of you probably know Jeremy Bandy and I was talking to him the other day and your guest walked in the room, our permitting person in the water department, and he, you know, he's, he's heavily accidented from India, and he says, this guy, Jeremy Bandy, he don't do nothing. I said, if you want to see somebody who doesn't do nothing, you should just follow me around for a day. <laughs> and it's really amazing, we are an agency, and I preach this, and you're probably tired of hearing me say it, but we're an agency of superstars. And I have gotten to see how we compare on the national stage through my presence at ECOS meetings, which is Environmental Conference of States. And everybody in the United States that has my job goes to this, pretty much. So last at the last meeting, there were 44 of the 50 states. And sometimes we get people from some of the tribes who have their own DEP folks. And it's really interesting to hear other people talk about their water programs, their air programs, their oil and gas programs. And I can tell you, people have no idea how how far out ahead we are of most jurisdictions in terms of our programs. And our oil and gas is no exception. Marty is certainly one of our superstars. I, I'd like, just so I know which way to run from, I'd like all of the DEP folks that are in this room to please stand up. Just so I know. Come on, don't be shy. All of you. Look at that. Okay. It's, a, it's a pretty small and a, and a very efficient group. Um, and I, I couldn't say enough good things about them, and particularly Marty's counsel. He's always on it. He always advises me. Um, he tells me what to do and when to do it, and I do it because he's always telling me the right thing to do and the right time to do it. So thank you very much, Marty. Um, otherwise, uh, to get down to a little bit of business, oh, I will tell you one thing just about going on the permitting side you know, our state versus other states. You know, when I first took office, everybody comes in and says, my gosh, if you did it the way Pennsylvania did it or Ohio do it, you'd be such a better state. Well, I was on a panel in uh, Houston for a conference, and one of the speakers said, in Pennsylvania, the DEP stood for don't expect permits. And, uh, so anyway, uh, I'm really proud of our program. I'm gonna keep talking about that. We don't have a lot of we don't have a lot of legislative agenda right now. We have a few things that are that are going out, but it's in the it's in the hands of the will of the people, and I'm going to trust the people that work here to get out there and exert the will of the people on their legislators so that everything comes through the way we'd like it to come through. Um, I will say that we do. Um, it's not doesn't appear that it'll get solved at this particular session, but we have been working with IOGA and the other guys, and we've been talking to them about a funding gap that we're going to have in our oil and gas, and it sort of looks like if we didn't do anything, we'll run out of money within about 18 to 24 months. Uh, we have some ideas about how to fix that, and we're working with you all, and of course with uh, gas prices as high as they are, I'm sure it won't be any problem to get it out of the industry. Um, but once again, those good folk, folks that stood up back there, they want to keep their jobs, and we want to keep them because we have a great program and we want to make sure that, that it continues and that it's properly funded. Um, so, and as I said, I want to make sure you understand that Marty and his staff have been talking with Charlie and you know, saying, hey, we've got this issue, how are we going to solve it? So I suspect we'll come up with something that makes a lot of good sense. Uh, pipelines. I had the good pleasure to meet with uh, Toby Rice, the chairman of EQT, came to my office and sat down. We talked for about an hour and a half, and I learned so much about his organization, and so much about EQT. He's, I'm sure many of you have met him and know him, but he's my kind of person because he's a simplifier. He said his goal in his business, uh, I think 
think they have 18 or 20 billion dollars worth of assets. His goal was for his business to be as boring as it could possibly be. He wanted everything to happen when it was supposed to happen and how it was supposed to happen. And that's the way I feel about my job. Uh, my cousin Gaskin said he figured the DEP out. He said, you want to put somebody over there who knows what they're doing, and you don't want to hear one word from them ever. And I make that a, a, a mission of mine is not to go to the government. Now they come to me sometimes, but I try not to take them anything. I try to get it handled. And uh, I also, I, sh I should mention as well, uh, Harold Ward and Scott Mandarola. Uh, once again, people have no idea, but when you get out in the nation, you find out that Scott Mandarola is probably, probably one of, if not the preeminent expert in water in the United States. And certainly Harold Ward is the preeminent expert in mine. And between the two of them, there's not much that they can't answer or get done. Uh, pipelines. MVP, the Army Corps of Engineers, has approved the special conditions for the nationwide permit. Um, we don't know how MVP will proceed from this point, but as far as we're concerned, West Virginia's done what it's supposed to do. The Army Corps of Engineers has done what they're supposed to do. Now, MVP and their attorneys have to figure out how to approach the Fourth Circuit and say, okay, by the way, all the reasons you stopped us are now gone. We're ready to move forward, let us do so. Uh, ACP is a different situation. It's held up by federal problems and not state problems. Uh, and going back to Toby Rice, we talked about pipeline capacity, and I think his statement was the basin has about 33 BCF a day of production, about 35 BCF of capacity, and MVP and ACP are going to add somewhere between three and a half and four BCF per day. So we need to get those done so we can get some of this gas out of our state, get it where it's needed, increase our severance taxes, and hopefully get some of this supply used somewhere so we can get the gas prices up. Gas prices up. Yeah, come on. Uh, and uh, last, uh, lastly, I guess I, I should brief a little bit about the Governor's Downstream Jobs Task Force, uh, which was created in August. I was appointed the chair. The other members are Dave Hardy, Secretary of Revenue, Ed Gunch, Secretary of Commerce, uh, Chelsea Ruby, Commissioner of Tourism, and uh, she got a really big standing ovation at the State of the State, and I didn't get one, and I'm a little jealous about that. But anyway, Chelsea, uh, Javier Reyes, the head of the business school at WVU, and Jim Wood, who took Brian Anderson's job, at least on an acting basis. And uh, everybody on the task force, uh, Hoppy Kurtzival said when he interviewed me right after we went on at the state chamber at the summit, he said, the landfills of West Virginia are completely full of task force reports. Task force reports. How are you going to be yours? How is yours going to be any different? I said, well, the governor didn't ask us to do a report. The governor asked us to do something. So everybody on the task force has a specific task that they are specializing in and that they're working on to try to move us forward. Uh, Jim Wood is a very intelligent man. He works with the Shell Crescent and the Tri-State Shell Coalition. He's in Morgantown. He's connected to that, that university group. Of course, Javier Reyes, their research capabilities and the ability to bring the resources of West Virginia University to bear on this subject of economic development are great. And of course, Dave Hardy, Chelsea Ruby, the people come to work in a state for the same reasons they come, I'm sorry, for the same reasons they come to visit a state. So what she's been able to do by increasing our market share and our exposure is going to have a benefit to bringing jobs to West Virginia. I believe this, and I believe it completely. Um, and I'm leaving out the last number, maybe it's me, but anyway, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. It's, it's been a real pleasure to work with them. We've had, um, since we were formed, we have a lot of communication, and I have talked to every member at least once every two weeks, and we have had one meeting. We had a conference call. We're now set, setting up a, a monthly call in for 30 minutes just to brief for everybody to get briefed on what's being done. Uh, significantly, we thought it would be a good idea to maybe have someone coach us a little bit on our sites and what our sites look like in West Virginia and what we might do as far as a major, you know, petrochemical plant might might look like in our state. So using 
the resources of the DEP and our GIS capabilities. We've sort of flown the state with Google Earth and done some drone work, and we've sort of taken a whole new look at what kind of sites we have. We did bring in a site consultant that we contracted to do a training seminar for us on how the world is previewing and um, looking at sites these days. And it was a very interesting exercise. This particular firm has cited several crackers and their base is in, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So they, we set up a, a seminar for them to come and it was gonna be on a Monday and Tuesday. Well, 10 days before that Monday on a Friday, they sent us a request for information and said, hey, we're gonna do a mock trial and, and we want you to make a presentation to this mock company that's gonna come in and look at putting in a cracker in West Virginia. So and they said, by the way, we want that back in seven days. There were probably 900 cells on a spreadsheet to fill in. And well, we did the best we could. And we, you know, we have uh, James Allery, who's with the development office, works specifically for the task force. He's moved over to the DEP building. He really is very good, very accomplished, and very well thought of in the petrochemical industry. Um, so we, we sent the information back and they came in They came in on that Monday. The first thing they did was said, okay, just to give you an idea of how this works, he said, we gave you seven days because that's typical in the industry. You don't know who sent it out. They come to us and say, send this to this, this many people. We send it out to that many people. The first thing they want to know is if your state's prepared. That's why they only give you seven days. They think you should know all this stuff ahead of time. We didn't know a lot of this stuff. It's not complicated necessarily, but it's things like how much ground pressure can we put on that site? In other words, how big a factory can we put there? Uh, we did the best we could. We filled it out. We sent it back. Then they went through and showed us the actual results of an RFI that a company had done in siting. And the matrix that's used in scoring is every, all 900 of those cells gets a score. And they put it in a big matrix and then they total it up. And on this particular project, by the way, if you can't answer a question, you get a zero in that block. And on that particular project, the high score was 68. The next score was 67. And the next score was 66.7, three tenths of a point. They only took the top two sites. So that third site got kicked out over three tenths of a point. And that's how, and there were seven, there were eight total sites. So two got in for the final run, the other six were kicked out, and the number three person got kicked out over 0.3 points. So we, it, it was a really good exercise for us to see how the industry is working, how the site selection industry is working. So we're going to get closer to those folks. Um, otherwise, you know, as the governor said, by the way, it's been a pleasure to work with my governor. Um, he leaves me alone. And, I've told people before, they give this test at the DEP that talks about your traits. And one of the traits is your manageability. And if you're 10, you do what everybody tells you to do. And if you're a one, you chafe at the bit to do your own thing. I'm a one. So, uh, but the governor has, has been great to work with. He's been a really good leader. I've been very, very impressed with his processor. He's very smart. He's very analytical. And he had, he's a simplifier. He can get to the bottom of the problem in a hurry and say, okay, here's what we need to do in this particular situation. And in three years, I've probably met with him 10 times on business. So, um, but he's, he's been a big supporter of mine. I'm a big supporter, so, supporter of his, obviously. That's really about all that I have to say today. Uh, I couldn't thank everybody in this industry and the midstream industries that have helped educate me about um, your mission and how you go about your mission. I uh, feel today about the task force the way I took when I, the way I felt when I took the job as the DEP cabinet secretary was, oh my gosh, what have I gotten into? Because it is big. Um, and as I say, the good news is the realm of possibilities is unlimited for the state of West Virginia. The bad news is the realm of possibilities is unlimited. So getting, gaining focus and figuring out where to go has been difficult. I will say that short term, there's going to be at least one and possibly two crackers right near our state. Actually, I tell people if this PTT cracker gets done, it's actually a West Virginia cracker because it connects by a bridge. The site basically connects by a bridge to Moundsville. And so those crackers are going to be a great benefit to the state of West Virginia in terms of jobs and the economy and what goes on in that region. 
but those pellets are going to get, start getting spit out of that. And um, if you want to see a really interesting example of what those pellets do, all you do is go to Glenville, West Virginia, because <clears throat> um, Doug Morris has a plastics factory, and they use 50 million pounds of these little white pellets every year to make big plastic pipe, and, or little plastic pipe, or all kinds of plastic pipes. Well, not, yeah, plastic pipes. As a matter of fact, is Al Shope in here? He was, okay, he left. He's back there. The day I went, they were producing a 21-inch pipe with a three-inch wall and it had white stripes going down. I said, what's with the white stripes? They said, Intero wants all their pipes to have white stripes on so they don't mistake them for somebody else's pipes. And uh, by the way, Al's been a great supporter of me and the task force, and uh, thank you, Al. Thank you, Intero. Um, but anyway, it's a great example of, you know, what can be done with, with polyethylene pellets. And that's going to be the sole product out of the shell cracker, polyethylene pellets. And that cracker, um, if, you, if you live in the Gulf, you've got to put your pellets in a train to get them to 70% of the U.S. market, which is the Midwest and the Northeast. They are putting in a 90-bay truckloading dock, and they have 42 storage silos. And they're advertising to their customers, hey, just in time delivery. You call us today, we'll have a truck to you tomorrow for anywhere in the Northeast or the Upper Midwest. So it's a really interesting um, effort to capture market share. I think they'll probably be successful at it. And uh, anyway, I really appreciate your support. I, I get a lot of positive comments about our team and the work they do in the field. And uh, it's very gratifying. And it's an honor to be in my position. And it's an honor to be a part of this government. And it's an honor to know most of you all. Thank you very much.